Welcome to this webinar on uh, the opportunities for local authority fleets and the potential for transport decarbonization using uh, biomethane. <clears throat> We're part of Decarbonizing Transport Week. Uh, this is being organized by ADBA, the Anaerobic Digestion and Bioresources Association. My name's Chris Hewn, I'm the chair. Uh, I should perhaps give you a few housekeeping uh, points. The housekeeping rules to ensure the smooth running of the event. Uh, select the speaker view at the top right hand corner of your screen to get the best view of the presentations as they come through. Please use the Q&A section to ask any questions and they'll be reviewed and addressed in the final section of the webinar. Uh, please use only the chat room for admin issues or general inquiries. And if you could please make sure your microphone is on mute to avoid uh, noise disrupt disruption. Uh, the ability of uh, puppyish golden Labradors to add something to uh, a webinar on decarbonizing transport is fairly limited. So if we could uh, please go to mute, that would be really great. Uh, let us kick off. Uh, this is an important issue uh, for us uh, to deal with today because there is a, a whole set uh, of, uh, in my view, quite important advantages uh, in using biomethane as a transport fuel for heavy goods vehicles, for passenger service vehicles, uh, which allow us to make some real headway on decarbonizing uh, the transport sector. And we've got a very good panel here to address some of these issues. I'd like to start uh, with Wasandara Doradania, who is our policy analyst at ADBA. And Wasson is going to give us an overview. We'll then move on to uh, Philip Felt, the co-founder and CEO of CNG Fuels, uh, Mark Richmond, the technical director at WRM, and Deborah Delaney, the general manager at Biocapital. Uh, so we should be able to cover, hopefully, all the bases for any questions that you may have, and I'll hand over straight to Wasson to give us uh, a first presentation. Wasson. Great. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, let me share the screen again. Um, okay, one second. Uh, can you confirm me that you can see the slide only and not the notes? Uh, yep, that looks good. That's perfect. Um, so, yeah, thanks, Chris, again uh, for the introduction. So, my name is Vasundara. I'm a policy and market analyst with ADBA. And welcome again to our webinar on decarbonizing the transport sector using biomethane. So, in the next 10 minutes, I will give you a brief overview about the potential of biomethane um, to advance decarbonization efforts uh, of the transport sector, especially heavy goods. Uh, vehicles. And I will also touch on the opportunity for local authorities to take advantage of this area. Moving on, before getting into all the good details, I want to give you, uh, show you these charts and talk to you a little bit about the greenhouse gas emissions from the transport sector. Um, transport is the largest GHG, greenhouse gas em emitting sector in the UK. And in 2021, the sector produced 437 million tons of um, CO2 equivalent um, emissions, which contributed to about 26% of the UK's total emissions in that year. Um, it's also the slowest sector to reduce emissions since 1990. And speaking about how much it contributes to air pollution, 32% of the nitrogen oxides emissions and 14% of, percent of the particulate matter, PM2.5 emissions, came from the transport sector in 2021. And diving into the sector emissions within the transport, heavy goods vehicles are responsible for 20% of these transport emissions. Now, I did this presentation last year at the Decarbonizing Transport webinar also using 2020 statistics. And when I'm working on this slide, I realized that all of those numbers have been increased from 2020 to 2021. So it's not going down and it's um, it's it's an issue. So that shows that we need 
solutions. We know that the UK needs to decarbonize this sector immediately, but we simply don't have time to wait for alternative technologies to become commercially feasible and commercially available to that scale. And biomethane, it's the best available ready to use technology solution. And it, with the cap capability of decarbonizing, uh, to start decarbonizing the sector immediately. And looking at the statistics, these uh, numbers are from our pamphlet report, bio, uh, bio gas insight report on transport. Looking at the statistics, if we rapidly deploy biomethane, emissions from HGVs could be reduced by 38% by 2030. But if we wait for electricity or hydrogen trucks to be deployed, the emissions would be cut by just 6% over the same period. Now, the good news is that more HGV, like heavy good vehicle fleets, are transitioning to biomethane fuels as the companies recognize its ability to deliver return in investment and cut carbon emissions. And also, fueling HGVs with biomethane can, can cut well-to-wheel emissions by 80% per kilometer driven compared to diesel. Um, for context, well-to-wheel emissions are emissions related to fuel production, processing, distribution, and use. Um, compared to diesel, uh, compared to diesel trucks. So now, tying into why biomethane can be a practical and immediate solution to decarbonize the sector, uh, the transport sector, which is inarguably one of the hardest to the hardest to decarbonize sectors. Sorry, first, continuously growing supply. Anaerobic digestion or AD plants. They recycle organic waste to generate waste to generate biomethane and other bioproducts. Currently, the UK has over 720 AD plants that are operational across the country. Of these, 133 plants uh, upgrade biogas to biomethane. So they are biomethane plants. And they produce around seven terawatt hours of biomethane per year. And this sector, it continues to grow each year with a growing potential to supply biomethane um, as a transport fuel, um, which can fill over 40% of the uh, HGVs at the sector's full potential. I'll get into that a little bit later. Now, the second one is utilization. There are already over 600 gas-fueled HGVs operating in the UK. And this number, it grows rapidly. And major industry players like Asta, Jean Louis, et cetera, have already transitioned from diesel to gas fuel trucks. And as for the station distribution, as you can see um, from the map here, sorry, as you can see from the map here, um, there are 40 fueling stations distributed across the UK with more in the pipeline, but that's um, more details about this will be uh, discussed by Philip uh, later, in the later in the session. And about the current sector, current state of the sector in the UK, um, currently the energy consumption by the HGV sector in the country is around 81 terawatt hours. And the AD sector generates enough biomethane to fuel only about 8.5% of this um, uh, sector con consumption in the UK. But at full potential, there are as already available and unavoidable organic wastes are recycled through AD, an estimated 54 to 55 terawatt hours of biogas can be produced. If all this biogas were to turn into upgraded into biomethane, that's enough to fuel about 40% of all HGVs in the UK. And not only providing a fuel, alternative sustainable fuel uh, for HGVs, there's a big greenhouse gas emission saving aspect as well. Currently, the AD sector contributes to about 5.1 million tons of CO2 equivalent greenhouse gas savings across the country, which translates to about 5.2% of total greenhouse gas emissions from um, the UK's domestic transport sector. And at full potential, the AD sector can save over 23% of these um, domestic transport related greenhouse gas emissions. Um, now, I want to show you in a much simpler way the opportunities that local authorities have, uh, food waste collection has um, for using biomethane fueled vehicles 
in this kind of a sustainable closed loop system. First, um, food waste can be converted into biomethane via anaerobic digestion. And this, we know this process breaks down organic matter in an oxygen-free environment to produce biogas, which is then upgraded to biomethane. And this biomethane, you can see in the second part, this biomethane can then be used to fuel waste collection, food waste collection, and any waste collection trucks, replacing, replacing traditional um, diesel fleets in the local authorities. And biomethane is a carbon neutral fuel and it's derived from waste rather than fossil sources. So there is that sustainability and reduction of emission component as well. Finally, these biomethane powered refuse trucks, um, waste collection trucks can be used by local authorities to collect food waste in their areas. Given that AD is the government's preferred solution, to treat food waste, these food collected food waste can be brought right back to an AD facility, completing the circular sustainability loop. So the end result is a very integrated system where food waste is able to generate its own fuel for the trucks that collect it in a, in a circular system. And digging more into how this is a opportunity, good opportunity for local authorities beyond uh, beyond reaching the regulatory requirements. Um, with many local authorities now declaring a climate emergency, there is a pressure to dramatically reduce um, emissions, scope one emissions from their operations and reach net zero within the next decade. And for many of the local authorities, a major contributor of their emissions is waste collection fleets. fleets. And also this new policy um, on simpler recycling mandates, it, it mandates local authorities uh, to collect food waste from households on a weekly basis, which will further add to these emissions if it's not now. Um, this is where a circular solution like AD can become an opportunity, as I also showed in the previous slide, um, where local authorities can switch their diesel waste collection fleets to biomethane um, and delivering core benefits across the sectors. So there are some local authorities that are already doing this. For example, Liverpool Council, they have a fleet of 20 biomethane field refuse collection trucks, and they have that is the UK's largest eco-friendly waste, manager, waste management fleet. And apart from that, the benefits of using this biomethane for uh, trucks is huge compared to traditional diesel trucks. For one, this CNG vehicles fueled by biomethane can reduce nitrous oxide and particulate emissions by up to 90%, dramatically improving the air quality as well. And on the cost and financial side, due to the lower fuel duty of gas, refueling the trucks, um, uh, refueling the trucks with biomethane costs comparatively less. Um, compared to like for like diesel vehicles. And biomethane refuse collection fleets, they provide better working condition for um, better working condition for uh, waste collection uh, employees as well, waste collectors as well. They prefer these biomethane trucks according to the reports, um, stating improved air quality, less noise and less vibration. And also the low cap entry these trucks has improves their ease of use and safety as well. And the trucks itself are highly reliable and they require minimal downtime, which means cost is less in that aspect as well. And lastly, these trucks are clean air zone compliant. We know now many local authorities already have or looking to um, introduce clean air zones within the city, charging highest pollu polluting vehicles. By switching to biomethane trucks, authorities can demonstrate thought leadership and showcase the practical and economic feasibility of transitioning away from diesel fuel. Now, before I end, I want to make one last one. AD and oh, anaerobic digestion is a circular solution that can largely help decarbonize the UK's heavy transport sector. But also, in addition to that, can also deliver multiple core benefits like waste management uh, advantages, biofertilizer production, biocarbon dioxide capture for industrial usage, and also generation of renewable electricity. 
Um, with that, that's all from me. Uh, I'm slightly over time. So thank you for everyone. And I'll hand over to Chris. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wasun. Um, I think that's uh, absolutely fine and a good introduction to the uh, issues that we are dealing with. Um, I think what, probably the best thing to do is if we go straight through all the presentations and then save any questions for uh, the end. Uh, the next up is Philip Fjeld, and I'm uh, delighted to see Philip has a background, amongst other things, in the Royal Norwegian Coast Guard. So uh, there's a good link there with uh, with natural gas. But he's realistically he's been involved in the natural gas industry uh, now for more than 20 years. So uh, knows an awful lot about the subject um, and has been involved with CNG fuels. So Philip, why don't you take us away with uh, your presentation? Thanks, Chris. And um, Wasandawa, I'm I'm happy if you want to just share the slides and I'll tell you to to move on um, between between slides. If it's easier, you can share the slides, Philip. Okay, I'll, I'll share the screen then. Um, I hope you can all see this. Yes, that's perfect. And it's up. And that's if up. I move them up and down, you can see the move as well. Yes. Wonderful. All right. Um, so I'm on the list here as co founder and um, CEO of CNG Fuels. You'll see up in the left hand corner here. Uh, top uh, left-hand corner that says refuels. Um, we are essentially the same, um, but we did implement a new um, Topco, um, a new holding company structure last year, which means that CNG Fuels um, develops, owns and operates all of the refueling infrastructure here in the UK, which of course is relevant for the topic today. Um, but just to make it consistent, um, when we make slides on our end now, um, it's branded as refuels. But the, um, as I say, the entity here in the UK that develops this infrastructure and indeed refuels, as an example, uh, these 20 plus uh, refuse trucks in Liverpool, they run through a CNG fuels station in Nosley, Liverpool. Oops, Daisy, going a bit too fast here. Um, so what is it we do? Um, we've got an ambition to decarbonize um, Europe's truck fleet. Um, that doesn't mean that we 100% focus on biomethane, but, a very big but there, uh, we are market focused and want to deliver to our customers what the what the customers demand and what is also um, technically uh, and economically feasible. Um, and as of today, what our customers are demanding is is basically biomethane, that's it. Uh, we, we will be... Um, involved in hydrogen trials and you know, fast charging electric vehicles or electric HGVs in the next couple of years. But the bread and butter for this company for probably decades to come is going to be about putting biomethane into an increasingly large fleet of, um, um, uh, sorry, inc increasingly large, um, large uh, uh, number um, of biomethane trucks. Going. Um, just one quick point to clarify here. I think Wasandara mentioned 600 trucks in the UK today that use um, biomethane. Um, I can't really blame you for quoting that figure because the industry is moving at, at pace, uh, but that figure is now much larger. Um, so we today, as of today, have more than 1,700 trucks going through our station network running 100% on biomethane. Um, we know our customers have close to about 1,000 trucks on order. And of course, and then there are a couple of other providers as well. So in total today, there are north of 2000 trucks, uh, HGVs, and these are predominantly on the heavy end of the HGV spectrum. Uh, so typically um, everything from 18, but particularly 26 tons upwards. Um, and we don't see that growth rate slowing down. On the contrary, we see that um, in, you know, picking up um, even more pace um, going forward. We've got 13 stations in operation today, two in construction and a plan to roll out a lot more. And uh, over the last nine months, uh, we have saved more than 120,000 tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions across our, our station network. So what, is, sorry, so what does a typical station look like? Uh, this is the one we've got up in County Durham, uh, Newton Aycliffe. 
Um, this is a typical station that we develop. Public access, meaning anyone who, who, who signs up to become a customer can use it. We don't sell any, um, you know, any hot dogs or, or newspapers on site. These are unmanned facilities, very, very efficient um, uh, dispensing facilities for, uh, for vast quantities of energy. Uh, just put into perspective, one of these facilities can at full utilization dispense about 350 gigawatt hours of bimethane per annum. You know, a typical mid-sized AD plant is about uh, 40 to 50 gigawatt hours, maybe. Um, so you can soon see that, you know, we, we can dispense somewhere in the range of, you know, eight to nine um, uh, bimethane plant um, equivalents. Um, this can uh, fill up to 14 trucks simultaneously, 80 trucks per hour. Uh, it's unmanned. Um, we remotely monitor it uh, and so on and so forth. So as I say, very efficient um, ways of dispensing huge amounts of renewable energy uh, and open to lots and lots of fleets uh, in the area. Um, so once again, these are not built specifically for um, single uh, customer usage. These are for all of our local fleets in the area and of course uh, for customers who have passing traffic. Why are we focused on HGVs? Um, very simply, because if we can deal some, if we can deal, sorry, with HGVs, then we 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 make an outsized contribution to greenhouse gas emission reduction. About one percent of vehicles on the road uh, in the UK today are classed uh, as HGVs, but they make up or they emit uh, close to twenty percent of all greenhouse gas emissions. So you can see there that by dealing with a very small um, um, section of um, of the number of vehicles on the road, um, we can clean up almost 20% uh, of GHG emission. Uh, now, I, I know there's a lot of focus um, on, particularly from the government, on, on, on electrifying partic uh, particularly passenger vehicles. They've also got ambitions within, you know, electrifying um, trucks uh, and so on and so forth. The reality, however, is that particularly for the heavy end of the HGV spectrum, and I say the heavy end because, of course, an HGV can be anything from three and a half tons uh, upwards. Um, so therefore, what you typically see is that in the lighter end of, of the HGV spectrum, it is, of course, easier to electrify. But once you get into the heavier end, you have much more demanding duty, duty cycles. They're much more payload sensitive. Um, batteries um, become an issue and so on and so forth. So uh, you know, that's why our customer base today have one focus and pretty much one focus only, uh, and that is to decarbonize uh, near term uh, and, and medium term. Uh, and that means that electrification uh, and hydrogen for them today um, is not an option. Also mentioned, you know, why is um, is bimethane such a, such a good alternative? Um, first of all, it's here and now. Um, secondly, um, it is a very economical alternative, which we'll see in a bit. But more importantly, it is the only biofuel that can go um, uh, that can go uh, greenhouse gas emission negative, uh, which is a huge um, selling point and a huge attraction for our customer base. Because if you run uh, on biomethane, uh, which comes from manure, um, bio CNG from manure, you go heavily negative, um, and that of course um, is a great benefit. Now, you can also go negative, and we would expect to see that in the future for other feedstocks as uh, CO2 capture from biomethane facilities becomes, um, becomes even more prevalent. Um, so then you can take you know, food waste and other, other types of, of feedstocks that today are not seen as GHG negative, but you can then also manage to push that into negative territory. Um, and that's something as well that we would expect to see the trend um, trend going forward. And of course, you know, if you run on green electricity, um, the best you can ever become, well, not really, because you've got embedded emissions in your vehicle, but the best you could ever hope to become um, is to become um, GHG neutral. So how has biomethane been doing as a fuel um, over the last four, five, six years? Uh, so we founded CNG Fuels back in 2014. Uh, you know, here we are 10 years on. Yes, we've got a slightly different name, but as I say, CNG Fuels as a station developer and as the UK, uh, UK brand um, remains and will continue to remain going forward. Um, so if we look at you know, biomethane, um, what we've done essentially is, you could say we've, we've built an industry here in the UK. 
Um, when we started out, there were essentially zero trucks running on uh, on 100% biomethane. Today, we've got 1,700 going through our station network and close to another 1,000 on order. And, you know, the order book will just continue to increase going forward. Biomethane, however, has not uh, necessarily had an easy ride. Um, this is just a graph to show you some of the challenges that have been sort of thrown in our way. Um, Brexit, and you might say, well, how was Brexit an issue? Well, there was a lot of uncertainty within the haulage sector because of Brexit, how that would affect um, um, cross cross border trade. It affected the ability to get trucks into the country and so on and so forth. So that slowed down adoption. But even though it slowed down adoption, we continue to grow. Then as we got into to, to COVID, you know, 2020, um, we actually started to see proper lift off in the industry at that point in time. So despite COVID happening, despite the lead time for vehicles being really pushed out in time uh, to more than a year, uh, we continue to grow. Then, of course, we had maybe the biggest shock for us, which is the energy crisis. Why do I say that? Because the way we we um, uh, we price the fuel to our customers, it is linked to the cost of, uh, of fossil gas. As all of you will have known and certainly read about, uh, the gas prices shot up in, in 2021, 22, started gradually to come down last year in 23. But even through that period, our customers didn't park up their trucks on the contrary, on, on the contrary they continued to utilize them. And more importantly, order books continued to, to grow even larger. And then of course, we're now, uh, or maybe coming out, coming out of the worst of it, but we're still in a high inflationary period where we may or may not be in a recession, which again, affects the haulage sector quite quite badly. Despite all of this, last year we had a, we had a growth rate of 65% and we expect to see the same going forward. On the right hand side here though um, is an important one. Um, what our customer base says is that everyone wants to go green and want to go as green as quickly as possible. But no one can afford to lose vast sums of money compared to running diesel baseline vehicles and go green. So therefore, they're looking for something that, we, that is at least cost neutral or cost parity with diesel, but you know, ideally, maybe even, um, even, even saves them some money to compensate for the perceived risk of running a different type of vehicle than a diesel vehicle. As of today, or sorry, these are, these are February numbers, but as of February, our customers saved about 40% on a pence per mile basis compared to running a diesel truck. So that's a huge incentive for, for switching from, from one vehicle technology to another. So just in summary, is biomethane or bio CNG as we label it, is that just a you know short-term um, trend? You know, is it is it a is it a blip? Is it flash in the pan? No. We are now getting into the to the age of true mass adoption amongst our customer base. In fact, if we had more stations built, which you know, building infrastructure in this country is not easy. But if we had more stations built, we would have more customers adopting, meaning we wouldn't have 1,700 trucks, as you see in the middle here, running through our network. We'd have 2,000, 2,500, 3,000 trucks going through our network. And the confirmed order book would, would be much more than the 950 we've got today. And, and then finally, you know, the total market size here, and this is, this is in our estimate, this is estimate from consultancy, um, and as such, you know, we, we're, we're only at the, the really start uh, of mass adoption here. What is it we need more? Stations. We're not short of biomethane. We're not short of customer interest. And we're not short of truck capacity or, or truck production capacity from the manufacturers. It is purely down to stations. As I said, developing infrastructure in this country takes an awful long time. I mean, we've got one station location that we've been developing for eight years and we're still not building. Now that's an extreme example, but it just shows how long time it can take to try to get stations um, up and running. We are bending over backwards to get more built. We've got five um, projects ready to go where we're looking to start building very soon in the next couple of months, and then we'll continue to, to churn out more stations uh, after that. But this is a trend that will only reinforce going forward. Buy methane going into trucks is not something that's gonna go away anytime soon. On the contrary, it's just going to become more and more mainstream. Thank you. And I will stop sharing and hand the screen back.
Thank, thank you very much, Philip. I think it was very interesting. And I thought that your points about um, the uh, scale of introduction and the speed of introduction are pretty, it's pretty dramatic, although you've obviously still got a long uh, way to go. Um, can I just ask one point before we get on? And I know we sh I, I said we should leave it towards the end, but just as a clarification, you said 40% fuel savings. Is that just in the running costs or is that... You said pence per mile. Is that including the capital costs if you lease? Sorry, no, I should have clarified that. So that is not a TCO. That is your that is the pence per mile fuel cost uh, of running a vehicle. So if you run a diesel vehicle and you run that vehicle one mile, then it costs you 40% less uh, in fuel cost um, to, to run a mile with a CNG truck. A CNG yeah. truck is more expensive to buy, for sure, depending on the make and model and what kind of spec you throw onto it. It's about 20 to 25 grand more. Um, but typically, we see that payback in one to two years, and fleets keep their vehicles, depending on whether this is the private haulage sector or, or refuse sector, will keep a vehicle conservatively for five years, maybe more. So there are very strong total cost of ownership um, uh, numbers in there as well, but the 40% was purely on the fuel. Right. Do, do, do you have a sort of rough total cost of ownership uh, figure that you would be prepared to share with us? Sure. Um, a typical once again, this is this is from the haulage sector. So this is the the the, the long haul articulated haulage sector, private sector. Uh, what we typically see there over a five year period, uh, the total cost of ownership uh, is about seventy grand less uh, when you when you take into account. So so that is for a vehicle that typically does hundred thousand miles per annum uh, each. Um, compare that with a diesel vehicle. Given the fuel cost savings I just showed you there. If you then throw the um, the uh, uh, twenty to twenty five grand uh, on top initially, um, your total calculation you come out about seventy grand uh, in favour of CNG over a five year period. And the, and the sort of total outlay, if it was diesel, would be how much? So seventy grand is what sort of percentage saving? So you would lay out a CNG vehicle in Arctic. Once again, I'm running off Arctic here because we haven't got that many data points on 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 refuse vehicles. Although I would like to say we are now in. The pendulum has come across a bit where we're now having more and more discussions with refuse vehicles. But a typical, a typical, sorry, articulated four by two a CNG truck will cost you 120 grand, maybe. So 70 grand saving on that, and 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 a diesel vehicle would be 100, right? So 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 you but but your your total savings here are 70 thousand pounds. So it's a, it's a huge difference compared to the the overall capex cost of the vehicle. Well, that's yeah, that's very impressive. Thank you uh, for clarifying that. Um, I think that's that's great. Let's move on uh, to uh, the next presentation, please. Mark Richmond uh, from WRM. Uh, Mark is a technical director and a chartered waste manager, and has got twenty years of experience in waste management. So, a very good person to talk to us about the the potential local authority use of uh, biomethane in 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 fueling uh in fueling trucks mark thanks chris good afternoon everybody uh sandra can i just check the next slide please because as you share as you uploaded those yeah we're on the right ones great yep. um it. okay um yeah i just wanted to check that uh, we've got the correct version in there after a, a last minute change um so yes thanks uh chair and good afternoon everybody um Mark Richmond from WRM, as uh, Chris has introduced, I work in the uh, uh, area of local authority waste management across a range of materials, and um, including food waste and, uh, and organics, which is relevant to the discussion today. And in those consultancy services, I uh, deliver a lot of feasibility and business case work for local authorities. I also work on um, waste service and infrastructure uh, procurements. And um, as part of that, uh, also support officers uh, in their governance and approvals processes in uh, getting schemes through um, the, the council mechanisms. And I'm going to draw on that today, uh, those experiences to talk around the opportunities, uh, challenges and barriers that we have in the um, refuse collection uh, sector. So, um, yeah, well, Sandra has given a really good overview in her slides of the opportunity, uh, the associated benefits, and also the example of uh, Liverpool uh, City Council as, a, as an adopter 
Um, I'm going to give a bit more context around the the wider opportunity rather than focusing on the the the, the, the specific um, uh, mechanics of how that happens. Uh, and I know that Deborah will be following on with some some uh, uh, specific examples from from her plant. So the real driver here and the real opportunity is around the Environment Act, uh, which passed in uh, 2001, and this mandated all uh, local authorities in England, as Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland already have uh, mandatory collections in place, but all local authorities to provide a separate and weekly collection of food waste. Uh, there was an announcement um, in the autumn of last year, uh, which was uh, branded Simpler Recycling, and that um, has now confirmed that the uh, policies within the Environment Act will come into force in March 2026. So just to be clear, the Environment Act has set out the, um, the, 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 the policy and the legislation for food waste collections uh, nationwide. That hasn't yet actually come into force and Simpler Recycling has now uh, confirmed that for March 2026. So that creates a lot of opportunity. Uh, both in terms of uh, feedstock into anaerobic digestion and feedstock for producing these fuels, but also uh, opportunities uh, for uh, local authority fleets um, to adopt uh, CNG uh, fuels and uh, biomethane fuels. So firstly, on this slide, we'll just have a look at the, uh, some of the uh, opportunities and the investment opportunities. Um, so, as I've just said, you know, the, the additional waste services that are going to be introduced by March 2026 provide a really significant uh, opportunity. This is probably the la single largest um, waste and recycling policy uh, since the early 2000s when we had biodegradable, a focus on uh, biodegradable um, uh, municipal waste from landfill uh, and the landfill directive. So, a real uh, expansion and proliferation of services. Um, my consultancy has reviewed the um, uh, the market and uh, we see 159 um, new food waste collection services to be introduced across England. So that's 159 uh, uh, waste collection authorities that are going to have to uh, roll this service out. And that's uh, going to require them to procure uh, a large fleet. Uh, some work that we've done for Greater Manchester Combined Authority and nine of the collection authorities within Greater Manchester identified uh, the 104 new waste collection vehicles, refuse collection vehicles across those nine authorities alone. So uh, there's an opportunity there for those to go straight to biomethane rather than being uh, rolled out and commissioned by March 26 on diesel and then converted at a, at a, at a later stage opportunity to just go um, straight to biomethane. Um, and also um, to, 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 to start that service uh, with a, a closed loop, um, as, as we saw in the, in the earlier presentation, with the food waste that's being collected by that service going to the AD facility and the, and the, and the gas coming back in to, to, to fuel the fleet. It's a really important part of messaging as well. So um, yeah, there's there's obviously the the the, the, the transport side and the the the, the uh, reasons for for moving to um, uh, fuel in uh, biomethane fuel, uh, the carbon benefits, the air quality benefits, but local authority offices have also got to uh, encourage participation in these services and being able to show and having a very visible um, uh, um, a very a you know, very visible symbol of where the waste has gone and what how it how that waste has been used uh, coming down the street every week to collect the food waste is a really powerful uh, message to, to to encourage uh, uh, recycling of food waste. So we've got good opportunity there. Lots of vehicles required. Um, there's a, about another 160 or so authorities who are currently uh, collecting food waste. Uh, there's then um, all of the other uh, waste fleet, waste service fleets. So the residual waste, the dry recycling, you know, potential street scene services as well. Whole wider uh, fleet within the frontline waste and uh, recycling department uh, that that can be uh, transitioned to biomethane. 
typically it's a seven year fleet replacement cycle for uh, refuse collection vehicles. So even for those that are not going to be procuring a new service, that, that ongoing cycle uh, across those 160 authorities and those wider fleets is providing um, you know, a real continual opportunity to, to make this transition uh, from diesel uh, across to uh, biomethane. Um, the next point I've got here is that many RCV specifications are now comparable between gas and diesel. Um, so um, the first time we uh, looked at this at WRM uh, was in 2013, and it was a consortium up in Cleveland of Middlesbrough, uh, Redka, uh, Stockton, um, and um, Hartlepool. Um, and one of this one of the issues that was uh, examined there was the uh, torque requirement for the power takeoff and the compaction plate, which you can see uh, on this image is towards the back of the vehicle, which compacts the uh, the material, the, the collected waste into the vehicle. Um, we've had another uh, 10 years of vehicle development, and I understand that a lot of those uh, early challenges uh, around some of the fleet have now been addressed and that uh, service managers operating these vehicles uh, are finding very comparable performance between the biomethane and the, uh, the, the diesel. Uh, as the fleets um, expand, um, we are finding in our work that there is uh, a significant programme of depot expansion or, or, and or alteration, um, and that may also offer uh, the opportunity to develop uh, fueling infrastructure um, one of my customers, which is one of the Greater Manchester customers, they uh, have to reverse the final vehicle into the yard and then shut the gates on the vehicle. Uh, depot space is, is that tight. So they're looking now for new sites where they can uh, expand depot uh, facilities uh, and uh, looking at uh, gas grid connection, uh, looking at... Um, the, the opportunities to design that depot so that it can also be a, a refueling, a biomethane refueling station for the frontline fleet um, is a real opportunity um, and, and something that you know um, can further support and, and, and aid uh, the, 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 the overall opportunity. And that follows on to the next point, which, you know, co-location uh, with the anaerobic digestion plant is uh, not essential. Um, I often see examples, uh, particularly from Sweden, um, places like Jon Chopping and Uppsala, where fleet are being refueled adjacent to the anaerobic digestion plant. Um, that's not a necessity. We have um, contractual and commercial sleeving mechanisms that enable green gas to be uh, put into the grid by a supplier and, and taken out. Um, I, I've no doubt that uh, the examples Philip's just shown us there, the, 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 the image of the, 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 the filling station is operating on such a, uh, on such a basis. So um, it's, this opportunity, to be clear, is not tied to having um, the vehicle fleet based at the anaerobic digestion plant where the waste is being treated. And um, yeah, just following on from that, um, you know, grid gas can provide a stepping stone to biomethane. So um, some work previously with Leeds City Council uh, about eight years ago, um, they took on three uh, CNG vehicles into their fleet. Uh, this was a project that was undertaken with Northern Gas Grid Networks. And um, initially that those vehicles were running uh, off grid gas. But once that structure is in place, it's, it's everything's in place then for that to move over to biomethane supplied through that um, uh, uh, sleeving mechanism. So lots of opportunities there. And I think there's a clear precedent as well from authorities that have made this happen. Which Sandra mentioned uh, Liverpool earlier on, I mentioned Leeds City Council, and uh, I'm also aware North Warwickshire are also running a, uh, a gas fleet for their refuse services. So that's the uh, that's the that's the positive side. Uh, if we turn the coin over now and uh, look at some of the challenges and uh, barriers, uh, particularly in the logistics for local authorities. Um, 
we're in a we're in a post policy uh, uncertainty uh, landscape, um, and there's been a lack of clear direction since the uh, Resources and Waste Strategy and the Environment Act uh, came out. So for a local authority officer that's in this kind of post policy uncertainty landscape, um, there's a lot to do and a lot to think about. It's the, the, the reforms in the Environment Act are not confined to organics. There is extended producer responsibility for dry packaging materials. Uh, there is uh, deposit return schemes, again, for dry recycling materials and um, you know, a raft of other changes. We've got emissions trading schemes coming in on, um, on residual waste, which is sent to uh, incineration. So there's a lot of uh, uh, you know, sizable and significant change competing for local authority officer attention. Um, Beyond that, they've got to get these new services designed and procured. Um, you know, and there's a risk here that in addressing some of those really core topics to a waste manager's role, um, that diesel fleet option is just the default as these new services um, are, are, are procured. Some of those other things that I just mentioned there are really uh, pressing legislative changes Whereas uh, the biomethane option for the new fleet, uh, it is an option. It's a very good option. Uh, it's an option that has environmental and, as Philip was saying, you know, good commercial uh, benefits as well. But my, my fear here and, and a challenge uh, is that we may miss the opportunity um, as, it, as it's not an, a requirement. Uh, vehicle lead times, availability uh, and contingency. Um, Many authorities have been quoted 11 months uh, lead time for new vehicles. Um, there are examples of local authorities booking build slots with manufacturers uh, just to secure um, a, a vehicle on time. They've not actually given a specification for that. They've just booked the chassis slot um, without specifying what the vehicle is going to be. Uh, and again, I think this is a, a, another area where there's potential to squeeze out the option of biomethane uh, if a lot of those diesel, uh, if a lot of those forward slots are being um, uh, placed onto uh, diesel production lines. There's then um, a, a few financial points here, um, which, which just run through. Uh, yeah. The, the, the first really is around funding uh, shortfall. Uh, I suppose this could be a, both a challenge and also an opportunity for biomethane. Um, District Council Network recently reported uh, that two thirds of local authorities expect there to be a shortfall on um, in funding in rolling out these new services. Uh, so across those 159 that are still to roll out a food waste collection, the average shortfall was found to be around two hundred and ten thousand pounds. So, um, you know, a challenge there in terms of uh, making this happen. One again that is likely to distract and and, and kind of grab the attention of waste management officers. Um, but equally, you know, with that kind of shortfall being identified, got to look at this optimistically and uh, think about some of the commercial benefits of of running gas over diesel, uh, as, as, as Philip outlined. Um, another uh, financial um, challenge is the rise of the Section 114 notice, which we're all becoming uh, more aware of over the last couple of years. Uh, so this is a, um, a situation where a local authority um, it gets into a situation where the, 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 there's a prohibition on non-essential uh, spending. Uh, to date, we've got 14 councils that are uh, currently operating under Section 114 notices. Uh, and uh, if in those in those circumstances, uh, yeah, funding is restricted to, to essential service only. And again, another clear opportunity to see uh, spend on uh, biomethane vehicles um, squeezed out and, and perhaps the opportunity missed. So, yeah seen as an optional component in delivering that, that new legislative requirement. Um, final um, 
financial point here is around um, incentive, uh, stability versus value. So uh, a lot of uh, a lot of investors in AD are institutional investors um, that are investing uh, pension fund money uh, and managing those funds. And uh, from some of our due diligence work, we quite often see that stability uh, of return and certainty of a um, incentive scheme is uh, preferred over potentially higher values that may be uh, variable. So, um, yeah, that could see, in some cases, not all uh, green gas support scheme possibly win out over uh, the RTFC uh, mechanism. And then finally, um, yeah, competition from the heating energy sector. Um, uh, earlier in the in the introduction, we heard uh, that transport is one of the uh, areas where we're, we're quite challenged in meeting targets uh, for decarbonisation. Uh, heating is also lagging behind. So, uh, yeah, there's a perhaps a, uh, uh, a a challenge there between the the, the two targets and. Um, you know, in terms of the demand for biomethane overall, whether that's going into um, heating or transport applications, uh, very high demand for that. So uh, prospect of, of competition from uh, outside the transport sector. So, yeah, just a few discussion points noted down there. Um, and a few thoughts on the opportunities and challenges, particularly in this um, uh, waste collection area. And um, I'll close there and hand back to uh, Chris. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, that's a very useful discussion. Can I just just a couple of tiny things to clarify before we move on to Deborah? Um, do, when you're talking about those depots, um, obviously not having to be co-located with AD plants and therefore being able to sleeve gas through the gas grid, does that mean the depot basically has to be connected to the gas grid? Not not a big challenge generally but absolutely yes that's correct yeah yeah and just the other point that i was going to ask you on the financial squeeze there and particularly obviously those authorities that are in the unfortunate position of being hit by the section 114 notices does that mean basically they're just running the old fleet until they can free up the resources to do something yeah um so the 114 puts the, uh, uh, a limit on any non-essential spend. Um, I haven't um, worked with any of those custom uh, with any of those authorities uh, where who are under a 114 and whose fleet has come to its uh, end of end of life cycle. So you know, said so typically seven yeah. year. Um, so whether or not the replacement up bang on seven years would be seen as an essential spend or not under under section 114 is a question I can't answer. Yeah. So what, realistically, if you're running an old fleet, there must be a sort of crossover point at which the maintenance and repair costs simply make it a less good option than going for new vehicles. Is that is that generally something after the seventh year, eighth year, ninth year? Yeah. Is that absolutely. why that seven-year cycle is there? It is, yes, Chris, and uh, you know that that's increased um, over recent times as well. Um, you know, perhaps maintenance regimes, and also the fact that these vehicles are not running on to landfill anymore. That used to be a big uh, right. issue. So, yeah, that, that, I'd, I'd say the seven years is is a reflection of that point. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, let us move to our final presentation from Deborah Delaney, who's the general manager at Buyer Capital. Um, and Deborah, I think you're going to talk about the Warren's Group case study in particular to get some specifics in here. Um, yeah. I think you joined Biocapital in 2022, but has actually had a long period working in renewables and waste for over 20 years before that as a consultant with management roles in commercials, transport and project management as well. So again, a very good uh, person to bring us some expertise on this particular subject. Deborah, over to you. OK, thank you, Chris. Uh, well, thank you for providing me with the opportunity to join this panel, um, first of all. Uh, Biocapital, as um, we've been talking about, is um, five years old now and has just had their anniversary. They're made up of a couple of funds, Helios and Equitix, and over a period of time, they've acquired a, a number of sites. 
Could we go to the next slide, please? What's up? Thank you. Um, so as you can see there, we've got 10 different offerings at the moment. Um, so since probably 2019 onwards, um, we've acquired a number of assets. Mainly, you can see that we've got a covering across the, the Scotland area. Uh, we've got three sites up there. We've got a site over in Ireland that provides a couple of, couple of services. And then the one in um, near Darlington, which is the Newton Aycliffe site, which has both the transport and the biogas site. And then we've got a couple over in the Norfolk area and one down in Dagenham. Um, those are a mixture of food waste and agricultural waste. And um, the only one that has transport co-linked with it at the moment is Emerald Biogas, although we are making that a nationwide service at the moment. We go to the next slide, please. So, Biocapital um, or Warren's Group started collecting um, way back when we bought this business, some 5,000 ton mark. We're now sitting around 120, um, with 100,000 of that being um, feedstock or food waste. Um, basically, the fleet strategy is that we should be entirely CNG driven by the start of 2025. And that's something we've been working really hard to do. Um, and we're looking to expand our business further this year because we're actually um, constructing at the moment another waste reception on that site at Emerald, which is in Newton Aycliffe. Next slide, please. When we talk about circular economy, I don't think you can get much more circular economy than an AD plant that is using what it brings in and putting it back to the land or using every single product that comes out of it. Uh, we bring in the food waste. Um, we class that as feedstock. It's really useful to us. Um, and out of that, our sites have CHPs or gas to grid. The way that that works is that we create the renewable e electricity from the gas that is generated off that food. And we can use that for parasitic use on site or to feed back into the grid. We also do the same with gas on particular sites where we're close to the gas grid. And we then use the biomethane for transport fuel once we've cleaned it. Um, we're looking at the moment at CO2, um, and that is something that we're about to put in at a number of our sites. And we're also ensuring that everything that we produce out of every single site is fed back into a useful product. Um, the waste is coming in from local areas to our sites, and the end result is a biofertilizer once it has been through the whole, whole process, which we then put back out to, which means it, in entirety, this is a completely closed loop. Okay. Uh, for, we've been working with local authorities for quite a while now on our drive to net zero. Um, there's a, a whole host of issues that those local authorities have to think about. Um, there are bin sizes, caddies and their availability. I think I heard an anecdotal um, comment the other day that there's about um, an 8 million uh, facility to manufacture bins but there's actually a requirement of 11 million at this point in time. So those are the kind of things that the local authorities will have to be thinking about whether to put orders in now or to wait. Um, they're also looking... Deborah, I think you've frozen. They have their own collection. Sorry, I think you froze just briefly there, Deborah. Could you just spool back by 30 seconds? Okay. Where did you hear to, Chris? Uh, that's a difficult question. Where did you get to? Um, it's literally the last 30 seconds. You just froze. Okay. Am I back now? I take it. Yeah, yeah you yeah. are. Um, collection vehicles um, that local authorities may have are either in-house or they may 
use third party. If they have their own fleets, they seriously are looking at the moment at what should we be using, CNG, electric, diesel, how do we move forward? Um, and whether they should be source separated or split bodies, et cetera. The only issue with the fleets are that um, a good proportion of them are on quite long, long lead times at the moment. So these are decisions now, and very often they don't have that information to allow them to make those decisions at the moment. If they don't have an AD close to them, and of course not everybody is really fortunate, every local authority that they've got an AD placed right in the middle of their local authority, then they could have trans transfer station requirements in order to get it to an AD if that's what they choose to do with it. Um, for us, you can see that we've got filling station on site. Um, and refueling with CNG is an option for those RCVs that come into us from the local authorities. If they cho chose to go CNG, they could of course drop off the feedstock, drop off the waste, go around the back, fill, and continue on. So that's a really good option for them. However, at the moment, we've not got very many filling stations, and Philip's already told you about how they are putting together this this great the country at the moment. What this means is that they can look at a neutral carbon footprint for their fleets. Um, when comparing the sustainability of their own fleet on CNG to a third party fleet that may well not be on CNG or um, electric, there, there is no comparison. Um, but they're having to look at the moment at contingency plans in terms of if we don't get these vehicles on time, if we don't get these caddies on time or these bins on time. And that is very difficult in this market. The one thing that they can get from us is a sustainability and data management and data provision, which I'll go on to a little bit later. Of the next slide, please. Thank you. So alongside the um, local authorities, we also um, collect from larger companies. We do work for national and local brokers, um, and we also move feedstock between our sites should it be required. It's important for local authorities to know and other clients that they've got contingency in our sites. And that's certainly what they've got when you've got 10 sites around the country. If we can move that on CNG, um, all the better. Um, one of the things we don't want to be doing is moving this waste across country on diesel. Our own fleet at the moment that allows us to do that. We've got a really strong customer service record because this was um, a family business that we acquired and we've ensured that we've stuck with that customer service that we got originally. And we have an excellent customer portal and a traffic management system that allows us to track the vehicles, to um, email automatically to customers should there be any issues prior to and collecting the, and following the collections and allows them to have real-time information on whether their collections have happened or whether there is an issue en route to them. Um, where we have issues of contamination, for example, we can provide photographic evidence from the PDAs that the drivers carry around with them. And then we follow that up with regular contract management meetings with our extensive national commercial team. At Emerald, in particular, we've got ISCC accreditation, which means that for every bit of waste going in there and the gas that goes through, you've got full supply chain visibility. When we are looking at the manufacturing commercial waste that we deal with, the, there are a number of options for us at the moment. This is the larger heavy end of the HGVs. So we've got anchors and hook loaders that exchange skips and compactors. By the end of 2025, that will all be CNG, including the Arctics, to ensure we've got a complete, complete closed loop. 
Um, at the moment, we move solid food and effluent, bin waste, and we take that in, we will sample it and then move to proceed to a supply agreement or contract based on that sampling that we've had back. Um, the transport arm of the group is being um, increased at the moment and rolled out to all sites with movements between generally where we can at the weekend or moving it during the week where needed. But what it's meant for us is that it's budgetable and it's transparent. So at the moment we have, um, we're quite a small fleet, as you can imagine for an AD business, but it's growing all the time. We have four RCBs, which are CNG, and uh, from Iveco, we have two six by two Arctics, which are an Iveco conversion um, that do tipper and tanker work, and a further two are due to be delivered in March and April. We have a hook loader, which is a Scania CNG, and we have a hook loader, which is due to be delivered in July from Scania again. Um, we work with a company called Northeast Truck and Van in the um, locale that um, does all of our provision of R&M for us. And that's been a really good learning curve, I have to say. When we started in 2018 with the RCVs, as you can imagine, it was quite new. It was quite a new market. It meant that um, we were uh, dealing with things that perhaps we hadn't seen before. There was a lot of uh, engine, engine warning management lights, etc. cetera. Um, and you're going to get that kind of thing with a new CNG, uh, but they've developed over time and they provide a really good service now and we've grown and learned with their fitters at the same time. Um, can, we, can we go down a slide, please? That's it. Great. Thank you. So after the initial investment on the truck, and as Philip and Mark have said already, it, it is more for um, a CNG vehicle. Um, it's not considerably more. And when you look at the payback, you are looking between one to one and a half years at the moment from our um, calculations. But at the moment on the runs that we're doing, on significant runs, because we are moving from Newton Aycliffe, sometimes right up to Scotland, filling up one of Philip's sites when we go up there to Motherwell, and obviously starting off with a full truck from our site where we filled already, we're seeing around about a 25 to 35% saving against diesel running costs on fuel only. Um, and that depends on A, whether the, the load is, you know, right up to maximum on those HGVs and the, the RCVs and whether or not it's a particularly arduous run, if I'm if I'm being honest, you know, a long run motorway based all the way up to Scotland will take slightly more than running around locally, um, which we also do on our HGVs and our RCVs. But as I say, manufacturers have come a long way in ensuring the product is maintained correctly and it's efficient. So I think what the, the slides I'd conclude with are that, first of all, this is local energy security. You know, we're making sure that anaerobic digestion and biomethane production is creating a locally sustainable fuel source and it reduces diesel. We've all seen the, the fluctuating prices of diesel and we've been able to eradicate that where we're using the CNGs. Um, we're very conservative with our budgeting over the CNG prices, and we try to keep that as close to what is happening in the market as possible. Um, the local CNG installations that we've seen and the network that is developing with Philip and his team is allowing us to transport that feedstock nationally, should it be required, with little impact on sustainability. And the fillings pumps on site at the AD facilities that we build ourselves and have on our own sites on the ADs are relatively inexp it's inexpensive to put in. 
um, and it allows us, again, as I say, more accurate budgeting. Some of the challenges, let's get to the downsides of this. Um, obviously, the higher upfront costs that we've talked about. One thing is the lead times and the parts availability. Very often, if you're dealing with some of the companies we are, those parts are coming from Italy um, or other um, countries, and we find that there's extended lead time. But as we've worked through, what we've been able to do is come up with a, a critical spares list that enables us then to ensure that those people have got those parts in that we know will be, a, you know, an ongoing um, requirement and to keep them nearby and ready to go to fit. Um, availability and efficiency are comparative on the HGVs. Um, on the 44 tonners, uh, but on the um, RCVs, I would say they still lack slightly behind the diesel, just in terms of the, um, their availability at, for being used. And very often you will still get things like warning management lights. That is purely down to some of these kit being conversions, etc. but they're quickly resolved the people, the installers and the mechanics and the fitters that we deal with are very well versed in this and can very often resolve that over the phone. Um, the infrastructure, we would like Philip to open up all of his sites with the media to fetch so that we, we can get from our location to, for instance, the sites in Scotland filling in the, the site that I think he's got one's planned for Carlisle that would be great um, and we can only see that improving as time goes on so in much the same way as, as Philip we're, we're driving towards that we know that will come but one of the biggest challenges that we've seen and local authorities would see this as well I believe is driver perception for drivers that have dealt with diesel um, HGVs for a lifetime it, it very often is quite difficult to bring them around to the idea that CNG is good. They hear stories about, you know, from four or five years ago where the torque isn't as good and the range isn't good. And you do get range anxiety. And we just have to work through very slowly showing those drivers that that isn't the case, that we are getting good ranges on these vehicles. There is no issue with that and that we are getting, um, we're getting good availability and efficiency and that the torque is not an issue very often most of our drivers will turn around and say to us after a short period of time that they want to drive the cngs so i think the um the challenges thus far have been outweighed by the benefits um much more readily and they're recognized by all of our clients so with that, I'll hand back over to Chris. Thank you, Thank you very much, Deborah. Uh, that was very useful. Can I just ask you on drivers? I mean, you know, given that we're talking about quite substantial savings compared with the diesel fleet, I would have thought a small transitional bonus for the drivers to reflect the training involved would get them on side pretty rapidly, wouldn't it? It does get them on side. You know, nothing speaks louder than money. But at the end of the day, um, it's very similar to, you know, the drive over from uh, diesel to electric for cars. There is anxiety around the range availability and there is anxiety over um, are they going to make it to that station, you know, that, that Philip's opened up. Some... Well, typically, what are the ranges that we are talking about if you were to compare uh, a diesel? If, if we're talking about the HGVs, we, and, and that primarily is the one that's going to cause a range issue. Um, they are what? 250 full load up to Scotland, which is pretty good. So, sorry, I think you froze again. So they're three, sorry, 350 miles. We're meant, to, we're meant to get 290 and we're getting about the 250 mark on a really hard run up to Scotland at the moment. So mm -hmm. 
Um, and that, oh, it, it's far lower than a diesel. I mean, we would we would end up um, at the moment with that. We will get easily to Phillips site in Motherwell and over to one of our sites, and then we would need a quick top up on the way back down. But um, so yeah, this, the, this is is this relevant realistically to the local authority fleet issue? Um, the local, the local authority, locally, yeah, the local authority won't have an issue. We have four RCVs that run around all, all locally to us, probably within a sort of a, a hundred mile radius. I'd say there's no issue whatsoever. They go out for the day, they're out all day, and they come back in, they fill at the end of the night. So, on a few streets you know, that the local authorities would have to do, there'll be there'll be no issue on CNG. Okay. And can I just ask, I don't know who the best person is to answer this, whether it's you or or, or Philip, but the uh, the issue of potentially hitting constraints, or maybe Mark, hitting constraints in terms of manufacturers producing the vehicles, you mentioned that there have been conversions already. Um, is that not a potential option for the local authority sector as well? Uh, well, I'll let Mark and Philip talk about that also. But from my point of view, the conversion I'm talking about is is a six by two um, on the Arctic, which is not readily available. You have to convert what is already available in, you know, a, a, an Arctic. Right which creates a number of issues because you're trying to cram this into, you know, uh, into what's of the space that's available. So but that's not the... relevant. That's not relevant no. to the authorities either because they're no. obviously not going to be in an Arctic uh, no, situation. But I, the local authorities will just be looking at the RCVs with a, you know, map pack body or whatever it is they decide on. Yeah. Yeah. OK. And so uh, can I just ask, Philip, and Martin, looking at the, those smaller ones, if there if there is if, if there is a problem with the manufacturers that are offering uh, CNG trucks uh, with capacity and lead times, is is it an option to go for a conversion? No, not really. Uh, you'd want to go for. Um, well, my opinion is not really. You'd want to go for uh, a manufacturer-built vehicle. Um, I don't think the lead times necessarily are going to be a big issue. They were a larger issue some years ago. Uh, and just on those Arctics, uh, the 6 by 2s that Deborah was, was, was referring to, uh, those have been produced in very small numbers. To put into context, 41 of the vehicles that go through our station network today out of 1,700 are 6 by 2s uh, those will both, and they've been available on, on almost a hand-built basis, come second half this year, they will be available in factory-built uh, options from two manufacturers. So all of those issues that Deborah is, you know, is referring to, in case there is a local authority or someone else that does need to use six by twos, because they might need to for really heavy work, those will be available on a factory basis, a built basis, in the next six months, and with an increased operational range, which which will be which will be uh, in excess of what of what Deborah already mentioned. Now, in the past, certainly, I don't know if this affects local authorities so much, but again, but if you're looking at the HGV longer haul market, we've had two potential options for gas, haven't we? CNG and LNG. Mm -hmm. Is that still the case? That's still the case. Yeah. And does that basically mean that there is a that the, the fact that you've got two rival standards, which, as I understand it, are incompatible? Does that actually increase the like the range anxiety and the likelihood of you not being near a refueling point that you might need? I mean, I can only speak for our customer base, and the answer is no. Um, today, there's one public access, pretty much one public access LNG station in the country. Uh, there are 13 on, on CNG. So no, uh, if you go down one path, you will have spoken to fuel suppliers to give yourself comfort on that. And if you go down the other path, the CNG path, you'll have spoken to us to become comfortable with that. So, I mean, j just to take one step back, um, you know, we founded the company 10 years ago. 
uh, range anxiety was a thing that plagued or oh, plagued was was a concern for our customers five years ago. Now it's not. Uh, it's it's something we really hear. Um, driver acceptance or uh, you know drivers being nervous towards CNG no longer an issue. I'm talking about the articulated truck market now. Okay, not not the RCV market because there are much fewer CNG RCVs out there. But in the articulated market, no, um, it's business as usual. Um, getting um, getting depots or or, or getting um, you know uh, the the truck manufacturers um, to 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 provide sensible uh, maintenance contracts for these vehicles not an issue anymore. So we've 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 sort of dealt with a lot of these teething issues, if you like which were early on in the adoption that, that are no longer um, a problem. Right. Okay. Um, uh, okay. I think I've got a question here on the webinar from uh, for Philip from um, ISA. Curious to know if the RTFO scheme in the UK plays a large enough role to incentivize biomethane in the transport sector. What are the main challenges for market participants to use well, I mean, thanks to generate RTFOs. Well, you know, yeah. That, in the way, RTFOs are really, yes. Go, you, you first go away. A lot of questions in there, and I'm not sure. I'll, 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 I'll answer it the way I interpret the question. Um, hmm. um, so the RTFO scheme is a stable and really good policy mechanism that, um, that supports the use of, you know, bioethanol, biodiesel, biomethane, uh, et cetera, in, uh, in road transport. Um, it has no end date. Um, it has a, a blending obligation that increases every year, uh, and as such, has been has been sort of a, a bedrock foundation, if you want. My only criticism would probably be um, it's not ambitious enough. Uh, it could have even um, greater growth in its in its blending mandate to ensure that there's even greater incentive for bringing more biomethane and and and, and other renewable fuels in quicker and faster. Um, and I think the the negative and the downside is that the price spread between biodiesel and regular diesel is currently what sets the value of an RTFC. So when you generate RTFCs from biomethane, that is completely delinked to the cost of sourcing that biomethane. The, the value of the RTFC uh, is generated by the spread between biodiesel and regular diesel. And we haven't got enough time to get into why that is. I'm just pointing it out. So as such, um, you know, biomethane or RTFCs generated from biomethane going to transport are a price taker uh, of the RTFC price. They are not currently participating in setting the price, which which can be challenging if if, if the RTFC prices are are driven low, which they currently are. Okay, can I ask too if a uh, local authority is thinking of getting coming close to the replacement cycle, beginning to look at this and looking at biomethane? Very compelling numbers that you've cited for the potential savings over that seven year life of the new fleet. Um, and they'll be looking at some pretty horrendous increases in repair and maintenance costs if they keep going. So there, so all of that makes a lot of sense. What about the potential for uh, an electric alternative? How, how close are the electric guys to providing a real alternative? So um, we've looked at uh, uh, kind of like three-way shootout for a couple of authorities between uh, diesel, electric, and biomethane. And um, uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the I suppose the 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 the, 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 the selection of whether to go uh, biomethane or electric depends on a lot of demographics of the of the local authority area. So. Uh, I'm aware of um, an electric RCV, which has been um, uh, loaned to a number of local authorities to trial. Uh, my understanding from the evaluation of those trials is that it's worked quite well in some um, in, in some uh, high density areas. Um, you know, look, just to give just to give a, a kind of idea of uh, annual distance and therefore range, and when. Uh, previous speakers were talking about range anxiety before. Um, some RCVs, refuse collection vehicles, they're doing like nine, twelve thousand miles a year, um, which really isn't a lot. 
And um, when you're doing that around a, um, a, a city centre, so I know Cambridge City Council trial the electric vehicle, uh, some of their um, more, more densely populated rounds, that was working well. Um, the challenge comes when an authority uh, uh, you know, has a, a much lower population density. It's got um, uh, you know large rural areas. Um, you know, if you're in North Yorkshire, I know my rounds have quite a lot of severe gradients on them as well to contend with, as well as uh, a very long haul to the tipping point. So uh, again, just speaking from personal experience, I know that when the uh, when the refuse collection vehicle has been around the few villages I live in, it's got something like a 35 mile haul to the tipping point. Where it tips the waste and then it comes back out on a on a on a, on a second round and um, I think in those instances, Chris, you see uh, for operational reasons um, the, the 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 biomethane uh, winning out over the uh, electric. So yeah, electric very much um, you know in those uh, uh, urban areas. Uh, I don't anticipate them being uh, well suited to central London. Seeing a lot of electric uh, electric vehicles in uh, street scenes, so street cleansing, grounds maintenance, litter collection, those kind of uh, vehicles seem to be moving over to electric. And of course, a lot of those vehicles have a much um, uh, lower payload and a, a much lower gross vehicle weight than uh, the RCVs uh, and, and the uh, larger vehicles that we've discussed today. Yeah. So just just to give us a sense of what the sort of crossover point might be, I mean, you're, if you're if you're in an urban dense urban area, then you might be looking at electric as well as biomethane as an option. If you're looking at a more lower dense, uh, a low density population, more rural areas, suburban areas, you might be looking at biomethane uh, because electric is probably not going to be there. It, does the HGV market, Philip, tell us anything about the likely? crossover between electric and biomethane and is it changing i mean i know the hydrogen guys keep it seems to me to be almost permanently in retreat on uses for hydrogen uh, as electric gradually extends its capacity um is the same thing going to happen to biomethane or or not so the best way, I mean, whatever I say here, I'm never going to be seen as objective, am I, given that I'm the CEO and founder of a bimethane for a transport fuel it's all right. We've got, a, we've got a grown up audience. They can aim on. I'll try I'll try to be as transparent and as and as and as uh, helpful as possible. So at the end of the day, I'm an entrepreneur. We want to provide our customers with with, any, with whichever energy vector they want. If they want, you know, some kind of biodiesel, we'd find a way of providing it to them. If they want biomethane, we do that. Of course, that's what we do today. If they want hydrogen, which is why we're doing trials or fast charging, or there was something called pixie dust that by 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 magic could, could power vehicles, we'd find a way to provide that to our customers. So we are led by what our customers want and not by, by, by what we are trying to push down the throat of our customers. So that's number one. Number two is there's a lot of focus on vehicles. Everyone talks about, and I'm talking now about Arctic's, Everyone says, oh, there's a brand new fantastic Arctic out that can do, you know, four, 300 kilometer range on a summer's day on electric. It's amazing. It can cover you know, 70 to 80 percent of the usage of an, of, of, an, of an HGV in the UK. Sure, that's true. But first of all, how does it perform um, when it's not sunny and it's not 20 degrees? So that's number one. On a winter's day when it's blowing a lot and you're using a lot more energy. But then again, it's about how do you get electrons into your vehicles, right? So it's it's about if you've got a depot, uh, and I'm just trying to get this over towards uh, lo lo local fleets. If you've got a depot with 20, 30 RCVs that come in with a, I don't know, 200 kilowatt battery, whatever it is, and all of those need charging overnight, you might find that your grid capacity is constrained. That's a huge problem. So I'll I'll give an example. We want to build a large uh, public access CNG station uh, in Swindon. We've been told we and we want a one megawatt connection. It's it's not big. That that's that that's a fairly small connection when it comes to fast charging of, of anything. We've been told we can get an electrical connection in 2037. Yeah. So it's not just about the vehicles, it's about how do you get some form of energy into those vehicles. It's the grid connection issue. Uh, the whole renewables guys are talking about and you've got it this end with 
a large number of vehicles to refuel in a short period of time. Absolutely. So, and grid connection is a nightmare, isn't it? I mean, I yeah. know National Grid even now advertising that it's trying to uh, sort this problem out for the future. But the realistic answer today is that there are massive delays if you want electrical grid connection. It's, it's an enormous problem, right? And that is a problem that it doesn't matter what National Grid are going to do now on, on, on the transmission side of things. It's not just on the transmission side of things. And this is going to take decades many, many, many decades to resolve. So there's this there's this huge gulf between government's ambition of electrifying everything and reality. Yeah. And that's where biomethane comes in as a very good, credible alternative. And we get told, listen, biomethane is a transition fuel. It's a bridge fuel for an, an, an all electric future. And I'm saying, sure, that's fine. I would disagree with that. What I do disagree with is that that bridge is 10 years, 10 years long, no. That bridge today, I can't see the end of the bridge. Yeah, it could well be longer than that. And we are, after all, for most local authorities, talking as we've all discussed about a, a replacement cycle of seven years. So you know, uh, by all means, look at this again in seven years' time and make the best decision about what will look appropriate then. But for the moment, uh, it seems to me you have to deal with the real world as it is, and you can make some real benefits in terms of reduction in emissions and as you've pointed out reduction in cost um i think we've reached the end of our time so thank you very much i just for those um who are watching who didn't catch it all or wanted to go back uh there is a recording available and it will be on the uh adva website and i suspect also on the uh, decarbonizing transport week website but certainly you'll find it on the adva website so Thank you very much to all of our panelists. Thank you, uh, Wasson from the home team uh, for their presentations, which I think have elucidated very effectively an interesting area. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks all. Okay. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.